everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of words, recorder of videos, and tabletop role-playing aficionado. Welcome to another DM's Guild review, my written and video review series where I take a look at the adventures and supplemental material at the Dungeon Masters Guild website. With this video, I'll be reviewing the DM's Guild mini-adventure, The Frozen Forge, designed by Dustin Martins for Dungeons and Dragons 5th Edition. A review copy has been provided for the purposes of this review. If you enjoy my videos, consider using my affiliate links for your DM's Guild shopping and supporting me via patreon.com slash roguewatson. Shout out to my platinum patrons, Andrew, Brian, Richard, Joe, Will, Tiny Dancer, Crazy Pat, and Nick. And gold patrons, RPG Papercrafts, Charming Grenade, Pretty Boy and Yuma, Marco Stewart, Vicente, Gilberto, Sean, A.K. Cert, to be Adam, Dead Lizard Lounge, and Sam. Thank you all very much for your support. I do love my adventures on the DMs Guild. Uh, I have played not even half the published adventures by Wizards of the Coast for 5th edition, but I have played Princes of the Apocalypse, and I have played Storm King's Thunder. And that is relevant because the Frozen Forge is perfectly designed for either or both of those adventures. It involves the elemental cults in a pretty cool way and involves a giant, which I guess anything that involves giants could technically involve uh, Storm King's Thunder. Uh, as you can see on the box here, it is a six to eight hour adventure for fourth level characters. It does include some level scaling for uh, either lower level parties, higher level parties, or if you just want to adjust it to make things easier or more difficult. I really like the idea behind this adventure. Um, I absolutely love the map that's included. It is a uh, full color, detailed, virtual tabletop friendly uh, DM map and player map by uh, Elven Tower, which I love their work. So I really like the map design. I like a lot of elements of this dungeon. I think it's a little bit... Um, simple and sparse when it comes to the actual forge itself. It's basically a, you get the mission, you go to an area, you do the dungeon, that, you know, very obvious way that most D&D uh, &D sessions and adventures are structured. Uh, but just the dungeon itself is just a little too short and sparse and simple. There's not a whole lot going on, but all the tools are there to make it a bit more interesting. So I like the, the new monsters that are included. I really like the theme. I like the background information that told of a really cool story and event that happened to actually create this uh, unique kind of dungeon atmosphere. I love all of these different pieces, but just it's a shame that the dungeon itself just didn't quite interest me. Uh, the way I really wanted it to, so a bit of a misgiving there, but otherwise I really, really like the layout and design and the ideas present here in the Frozen Forge. So let's take a look at the Frozen Forge. Um, first of all, excellent, excellent layout. It's got... Uh, I love layouts that look like it's a professional product from Wizards of the Coast 5th edition. Like, it's got the proper font, the proper formatting, it's obviously very well written, well edited, um, has a really good... Um, these right here, these kind of blowout sidebars um, that I haven't really seen before used uh, for the few NPCs that the DM can uh, role play that are designed for kind of back and forth between the players. Uh, it provides a little uh, very succinct, easy, at a glance look of how to role play these certain characters by listing their general appearance, their mannerisms, so the way that they'll act uh, in a social situation, as well as any secrets they may be harboring, or maybe just their kind of overarching goals. This is a really excellent way of breaking down how to run a, D uh, a DM-controlled NPC without going through necessarily the entire, you know, traits, bonds, and flaws system that uh, player characters do. So I really, really like seeing this. Um, I would love to see this going forward with a lot more products, because I think it's just a great way of a really quick, at-a-glance, useful method of looking about how to role play these certain NPCs. There's not a whole lot in this adventure. It's a it's pretty short. I believe these notes there's only three of them, including the primary quest giver. We also get an entire two pages here based on the adventure background and synopsis that sets up um, the warring cults, which if you haven't played if you haven't played Princes of the Apocalypse, it's all about these elemental cults that are trying to bring about the end of the world, although uh, they're also not in cahoots with each other. They actually fight each other, which is kind of the cool part about that entire campaign is you'll come across these cults battling each other with their very thematic uh, creatures and weapons and uh, their own little NPC classes and things. So in this background, it works really, really well with Prince of the Apocalypse because it literally features the Cult of the Crushing Way, which is the water cult, attacking a fire cult forge. And the attack was successful, and it basically destroyed the forge and then the players come across the uh, devastation and kind of learn about what happened there. There's also an additional background information about how this forge 
uh, sold out to the fire cult by this um, uh, the daughter of the of the famous forge uh, runner. I don't know what you call the forge blacksmith person, um, Bashield. And none of that actually pertains or matters in terms of the adventure, which is odd because it's actually it's pretty good. Like the daughter basically sold out to the cult of the Eternal Flame because she wanted to be, uh, you know, kind of show up the father, and even ends up murdering her own father and all of that, which sounds really cool from a storytelling standpoint. But then none of that is used. It's all just in here for like DM information. But you don't even even meet that daughter character. Like everybody was basically killed in this attack, which is. Uh, very oddly disappointing because again it like sets up this really cool story and it doesn't really do anything with it. Uh, instead, what happens is the water cult hired a uh, a frost giant, promising basically the same thing how people hire adventurers is hey go do this thing and you can keep all the loot that you find. Uh, and they give him one of those devastation orbs, which were again used in Princes of the Apocalypse. Again, see, I'm glad I played this adventure because I'm more relevant to be able to review this. Uh, which is a devastation orb that unleashes whatever their element happens to be. So in this case, it was a giant uh, ice bomb, which I don't think was an original one. I think it was created for this adventure. But the frost giant comes to this forge, which is now since been run is a kind of an operations for the fire cult, and attacks attacks them and drops this um, blizzard bomb down into the forge, which basically destroys everybody. Um, and releases the fire elemental, which has been trapped in the forge, which is what's been making them, making their forge run, and transforming it into this blue flame elemental, which you can see on the very cool cover page here. And it's actually like an undead elemental that instead of doing fire damage, deals cold damage, and seeks out all the heat around the area. And hence, when the players arrive in this uh, town in Chapter 1, A, there's a missing shipment they need to discover, which of course this shipment was... Um, supposed to arrive at the forge and then return with supplies and then B, the entire area is starting to become colder and colder because literally this elemental just keeps sucking in the heat from the entire surrounding area I guess and grows stronger and just that heat sucking is becoming more pronounced into a bigger radius so uh, and guess what those things are related <laughs> so uh, the players are hired by this Madame Aurora from this town of Loudwater which this part is a little strange because I actually looked on the Faerun map um, of where this town was located in relation to Princes of the Apocalypse, and it actually looks like, and again, I'm just guesstimating distance, like 200 miles southeast of where the Dasaran Valley is. So I don't know how the hell you would get your players over to this area if you were playing just in Princes, because Princes is basically just one small slice of the map with this big, giant underground dungeon, and then it had some cool side tracks that were in that area. So I'm not sure why the designer decided to move it um, that far away, whereas it seems like it would make sense if it were in the Disaran Valley. Uh, it would be very, very easy to, literally, if you were running Princes, to plop this in as a sidetrack that would fit perfectly into Princes, but with the caveat that if you go with the actual written town and the direct, and the fact that it, the forge is in Southwood and all that, you know, that matches up on the map, but again, that's like 200 miles out of their way, so I don't know how you'd get your players there. Storm King's Thunder, if you were running it from that point of view, it would be a lot easier to slot in, because Storm Kings is all about just traveling globally around the entire area, so you could easily drop in here. But there's more tie-ins with Princes, because it's a lot more about the cults than it is the Giant. In fact, you could play this whole adventure and never even meet the Giant. That's actually an optional thing that DMs can do for kind of a final boss battle if you wanted to. So it's very tenuous ties to Storm King's Thunder, and I almost feel like you know, is it just anything that involves giants can include Storm King's Thunder, or anything that happens to be anywhere in, like, that expanded, uh, I don't even know what you call the region to the east of the Sword Coast, but <laughs> that whole area of Faerun could be Storm King's Thunder, but it fits very well in Princes, with the caveat about the weird town placement. So Chapter 1, they get the mission, uh, they're offered a lot of money to go and investigate the forge. Chapter 2, uh, they're on the road to the forge, which I'm going to show you, there's some really cool maps, uh, here we go that were included here. There's obviously a really great map of the Frozen Forge itself. I love Elven Tower's designs. Uh, and I, you know, so many times I review a product that has maps that I'm disappointed with, and I'm sure a lot of people are like, well, Eric, what kind of maps make you happy? Like, if this doesn't make you happy, what does it? This is an example of map designs that I like. This is great. This is full color. It's detailed. Uh, it's got... Uh, it's just a neat looking design. You can see even on the second floor, like part of the forge's top has fallen down. Like there's just some neat shit going on here. Uh, and I like this design quite a bit. And it's, I believe, even Roll20 friendly. It's player friendly. 
and I think they even have like a black and white version of the regional map too. It's like they have all these different things in a zip file, which is just fantastic. I, that's super thumbs up. No complaints about the map. Uh, I have complaints about the actual design, but not the physical uh, map that we are given. So chapter two uh, is on the road here. Uh, the stocked road is the first one, and then they actually go up this uh, forge trail up into the forge itself. Now, a lot of times when you get the kind of intermittent chapter that just leads you from the town to the dungeon, again, this is very um, standard, typical stuff, which I'm not going to complain about because I think it does some neat ideas with it. But, um, you know, it's very much the Act 1, you're in town, get the mission. Act 2, you're on the way to the dungeon. And then Act 3 is the dungeon. That is very much what this is. But it does some really cool things with the Act 2 on the way to the dungeon chapter because every single optional encounter actually has meaning and purpose, which is really, really cool. That's something that I think everybody, me included, should do a lot better job of is making encounters, even seemingly random encounters, matter in the context of your story and in the context of um, in some way expanding upon either the enemy design or the lore you're trying to get through or maybe the regional area has these critters in it but there's something going on with them like don't just have a random encounter for random encounter's sake make those things matter especially because as we all know combat takes a while in D&D &D. like you're gonna spend a lot of your time battling why would you waste that time on something that's not going to be at least somewhat meaningful for the adventure you're creating? And especially when you have this relatively short of an adventure, you really don't want to just... It would really feel like padding if it was just like, hey, you're attacked by whatever random ice creature because ice stuff. You know, that would be the easy thing to do, and I'm so glad the designer didn't do that here. Instead, these are meaningful encounters that actually matter. So the only one that I think you for sure get is you find, like, a dead... Um, a couple of dead horses and what looks like just a caravan has been deserted and the cool thing is you can discover that the horses are actually attacked um, after they were already turned uh, undead which is kind of a cool uh, medicine check the players can make and then you get a series of these encounters but all of them are pretty good um, there's one with uh, zo um, ice zombies ice skeleton and a commoner this poor Melvin guy who you can rescue uh, it's actually a scene where you it's kind of very Walking Dead-ish where you can find the zombies all attacking his horse while he's up in a tree and you have to rescue him or if you try to rescue the horse but then the horse can actually turn undead and that could be a problem and uh, you discover the fact that, uh, that people in the nearby area are becoming ice zombies which is a bit of a problem uh, and they have a really neat variant you know cold damage attack and I believe a little bit better AC so they've been kind of ratcheted up because base level zombies are just not that interesting to fight so I think that helps a lot um and gives you a chance to actually talk to somebody who has some information, although it's really cool that he has some information that's true, some that's just conjecture, and some that's like half true, so they get a little bit of background information on what's to come. So that's a really good event. The Surviving Cultist is a f amazing event that I love. Um, this woman approaches who's really creepy looking. She's all scarred up, and she's got blue eyes, and frankly, if I know my players would probably just shoot first and ask questions later, but she's actually not hostile. She is a Eternal Flame cultist who survived the attack and is in the process of probably turning into an ice zombie, and to where she tries to, like, warm, you know, hopefully if things progress that far, she'll warm herself on the player's campfire, basically not ask, you know, not answer too many questions, and then eventually even immolate herself on the fire because she cannot feel warmth anymore. She's been drained of it, and as a fire cultist, that's like you know, terrifying for her. So I think that's a really cool event that's purely role-playing and just really well done. There's a whole thing about the Winter Wolves, which, fun fact, I've been playing D&D for several years. I didn't realize Winter Wolves were straight up, like, sentient and could, like, speak common and stuff. I had no idea. I just thought they were big, like, winter doggos. <laughs> so that was news to me. I literally looked it up after these events. I'm like, wait a minute, they can just talk to these wolves? Like, yes, yes, they can. Um, they get an optional encounter here where you can find the... Um, the cubs of a winter wolf that you find later on and it's a really cool encounter when you first get to the outside of the dungeon you can find the frost giant's winter wolf who's still stalking around there and it has been branded by the frost giant um, the frost giant was a very cruel master that ended up killing uh, his mate uh, and basically threatened the surviving winter wolf into submission by branding him and saying it was magical and he could like hunt him down but it's not magical so the players can actually solve this whole thing by just uh, investigating the brand and then revealing that oh it's actually not magical at all 
and then with a proper persuasion check, and this may feel very video gamey, you can uh, you can basically either convince it to at least not fight a b, maybe run away, or c if you really persuade it well, if you can even like join the party and gain a winter wolf ally, which is really cool, and I like that aspect a lot. So anytime you give me um, unconventional party allies or any creature that's just going to talk to the party instead of fighting them, I'm always on board with, so that's a really neat event. And the fact that you can find the cubs here will obviously make a big difference with how you can respond and talk to the Winter Wolf later on. So just really, really cool extra events that um, have a lot of meaning toward the story that they're creating, and I think it's a really great chapter and section. I was actually very impressed with that, because usually it's it's a nothing, you know, that whole, like, okay, just get me to the dungeon as soon as possible because these events are bullshit. This one is, like, the opposite of that. They're fantastic. Um, chapter three, the actual Frozen Forge, is unfortunately a little bit disappointing. Um, I love the, again, the map design is fantastic, but it just comes down to basically going inside and fighting this blue elemental. There's just not a whole lot going on. There, in the outskirts, you, you fight a bunch of the ice zombies and skeletons. That's kind of the big fight. And then in, inside, you just find kind of the devastation that has been wrought by the big explosion of the orb. You find a bunch of ice zombies, but they're all trapped. Like, they literally can't even get to the uh, the players. They're just all trapped in ice. And then the only thing is there's the ice zombie in Area 5. Uh, no, sorry, the uh, blue fire elemental in Area 5. Which, is, again, for a fourth level party, it's a CR6 blue fire elemental. This is supposed to be a pretty big boss fight. And it's got a really neat... Um, it's got the uh, the cold damage instead of fire damage, but it also uh, has to actually roll a wisdom save if it if it sees like produced flame. So if the party is really smart and they realize how this thing operates, they can actually manipulate it, uh, which is pretty cool. But that's kind of all that's going on. Otherwise, you just snoop around this area with this is mainly empty. It's just kind of frozen rooms. Um, there's an upstairs section that seems neat where you can't get through one door and you have to like go outside, but there's not really any like traps or skill checks involved in any of these areas it's just i don't know it's just it's a little spar it's a little too short a little too sparse and a little too simple in terms of its overall design which is a bummer because i like the map and i like the ideas and everything leading up to this area and i think with just a few adjustments you could have made this area that much more interesting for example maybe the blue fire elemental is what was keeping the ice zombies trapped so whenever you take out the elemental that frees all the ice zombies so suddenly it's like a it's almost like a load bearing boss but instead of you know dropping the physical dungeon on top of you you then unlock all of the enemies to suddenly coming at you so that could have been an interesting thing uh, it would have been neat to find like maybe a surviving fire cultist somewhere that would have been maybe mad and attack the players but maybe the players could have done something to um you know, calm uh, he uh, calm them down, and maybe gained a potential ally. You know, enemy of my enemy, kind of a thing. So, there, I just would have liked to see a few more interesting things in this area be utilized a little bit more, other than you're just going from kind of empty room to empty room, noting all the devastation and the frozen floors and everything. The only really thing that's in here of note is that uh, when you first find the fire elemental, it's actually like pawing at this trap door, trying to get inside. But it's just kind of uh, mindless because it's been undeadified, I guess. And uh, it just senses there's heat underneath uh, in the basement. And sure enough, there is. There's like one like eternal fire down there. And there's a bunch of, um, they're referred to as slaves. I guess they were captured from the uh, the fire uh, the fire cult to actually like work the area, to work the forge. Um, so they're down there in this pit. And uh, the players can rescue them, which is nice. I always like to see that. But there's not really any kind of role-playing notes or anything about that. And they don't really factor in anywhere so I guess you can get some uh, positivity with the final town but that's that's kind of all it amounts to which is a bit of a bummer I would have liked to see just a little bit more going on with the dungeon itself um, but even though I, I still really like the design of it and you know, I love the extra variants of the creature uh, the blue fire elemental itself is really cool so it's it's a neat idea I just think it's a bit of a misstep with the execution I would have liked to see it just a little bit more uh, involved in the end. All right, uh, let's go over my... Oh, um, one thing I want to mention... Well, I'll do this with the pros and cons. Let's do my pros and cons. <laughs> uh, pros, the optional encounters with the meaningful story ties and purpose. Really, really, really impressed with Chapter 2 and how well it uses um, several encounters to actually expand upon the story and make the adventure just that much better to where I would actually want to use like most of those optional encounters to drive home the ice zombie... 
uh, factor and the winter wolf cubs. There were some like wood elves in the area that were blamed for a lot of the problems. Like all these things could have been are, are can be used uh, in chapter two in those optional encounters and used very very well. Uh, pro excellent full colored detailed and player friendly maps of the forge dungeon and the regional area of Loudwater. Thumbs up. I have no complaints. In fact, I have nothing but praise for that style of map. Excellent, excellent job. Uh, pro, perfect role-playing notes for NPCs. As I went off on a rant earlier, I really, really love the way these little sidebar things are designed. They're just nicely brief, but have all the information I need. Um, they're well done at a glance, and they've got that nice little pop-out style, so I can easily see, okay, here's how I role-play this character. Very, very cool. Uh, pro, detailed epilogue for each faction and event. This is what I wanted to cover that I didn't technically cover a second ago, which was there's a really good aftermath epilogue section that goes through what the players did and how different things react. So, for example, whether you took out uh, the Frost Giant or not, then he could hunt the players. How the Cult of the Crushing Wave is going to react. Maybe they've got a base in Loudwater. How the Cult of the Eternal Flame is going to react. Maybe they're going to try to plot their revenge on the um, the Water Cult. Uh, how are the local undead going to act? Well, they're going to lose their cold powers and just turn into regular undead. So that kind of notes is really good because I think tendency for a lot of these um, smaller adventures is to make the full epilogue maybe just like a single paragraph whereas it might be, especially if you're making this as part of a bigger campaign and not just a one shot uh, you do want to have some things that the players do actually factor into the long term and I think that helps a lot, so I really like to see a full on epilogue like this, it's a full page of the adventure uh, con, my only real con is that the forge itself is just a little too short and sparse. It's just as impressed as I was with everything leading up to and even surrounding the forge, the actual inside dungeon delve is oddly like the weakest part of the adventure, and usually it should be the best part. And I think with just a few minor adjustments with a few more interesting things happening, it could have been a really memorable, interesting location. Instead, as I mentioned, it basically boils down to um, finding a bunch of undead outside, getting inside, finding this blue fire elemental, and then that's about it, and rescuing the people. That's really all it amounts to. Um, I was hoping for just a bit more involvement, and even the final frost giant fight is an optional thing, where I, I would have liked to see that actually as a scripted event that happens, you know, when the players leave, and if they did this, then this happens, if they did that, you know, the winter wolf can either come in and attack or defend, you know, more notes on that, that could have been really, really good to see. Alright, final verdict for the Frozen Forge. Uh, though a bit on the short and simple side, the Frozen Forge is an excellently themed mini-adventure that makes the perfect sidetrack or lead-in to Princes of the Apocalypse or Storm King's Thunder. Thank you to everyone for watching this video review. You can see my written review at RogueWanson.com. You can support my work at Patreon.com slash RogueWanson. You can follow our own D&D adventures here on my YouTube channel. Thank you.